Hello, Rick, and hello, everyone. Welcome to yet, yet another episode. I think this is going to be episode 22nd uh, or episode 22. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, and, you know, it's, it's very exciting to be in the world of content marketing and the world of SEO these days. There's so much going on. So um, we have, of course, an episode full of great topics. Uh, today, we're going to be talking quickly about um, the U.S. passing a, a, a bill in the Congress to ban TikTok unless they sell. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Also, Google integrated social media posts into Google Business Profile. So I think this is a, a great opportunity for local businesses, especially. So we'll give you an update on that. And of course, we cannot go uh, an episode this week without talking about the recent Google Core update and some manual action. Um, we'll talk a little bit about content ROI in one of the blog posts that we uh, recently published. And there was a very interesting study by our friends over at Content Marketing Institute about um, content marketing enterprise. So we have some interesting data there to share with you. And last but not least, as usual, giving you tips on how to create great content. We are going to talk about the advantages of using video with SMEs in pre-production for better content. So I know Rick has great tips to share with us around that. So in the in, in, for the sake of keeping this short as possible. So let's get into it right away. So I don't know if you heard Rick, but um, I think the news came out either this morning or yesterday, but, but the US Congress passed a bill to pretty much ban TikTok in the US. And what they're saying is that they're gonna give the owners of TikTok, which is, I think it's called Byte Media or something like that, Chinese company. Byte Dance. But, 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 yeah, Byte Dance. Mm -hmm. okay. The buy dance. Uh, they're going to give them six months to sell the company um, to a non, I think it's it going to be a non Chinese owner or something like that. So, pretty much, um, this is, is, uh, is towards banning TikTok uh, in the US. I'm pretty sure that Canada would follow suit if this bill passes. Now it has to go to the Senate uh, to get fully approved. But basically, um, what the U.S. is saying is that uh, it's just a security security threat, right? Because um, I think under Chinese cybersecurity laws, uh, they can ask TikTok to hand over data for, for, for uh, about their users. So, um, yeah, this might happen. Um, there's always a lot of politics around it, but um, I don't know. So, what 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 is the impact on marketers uh, if TikTok was to be banned? What do you think, Rick? Uh, well, what I think is not going to happen. <laughs> Lots of things pass the House that don't get through the Senate. I don't want to get into U.S. politics, but, um, you know, passing the House is just one one step in several. Um, so I, I don't know if I see that happening, and I, I can just see a bunch of 12-year-olds rioting in the streets if they can't watch their TikTok um, but as we've talked about in other episodes, Carlos, uh, non-traditional search platforms have, have been on the rise. So it would present an opportunity for uh, YouTube and any other platform that's tried to take on, you know, short form video um, to fill that <laughs> massive, massive gap. But again, I don't think I'd panic just yet. Uh, my guess is some some sort of resolution will be reached. That's my uneducated guess, but uh, purely purely a guess. Yeah, anything uh, at this point would be a speculation. There is so many. There, there's so much politics involved in this, and interest from from the different uh, <clears throat> political parties in the U.S. and economical interests. So, um, if anything, really, because uh, when there is an uncertain future. It's better to diversify it and be prepared to mitigate the risk. Um, I know I read in a different article uh, in terms of the stats that TikTok was the channel with the least ROI in 2023 for marketers, but it is also a channel that most marketer that marketers are the most excited about. So I guess the good news or how we we'll read that is that nobody's still very deep on TikTok or or if they were to if TikTok was banned, they wouldn't probably lose a lot. Um, of traffic or, or advertising flow. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to know. 
what will happen, right? So people, it's probably better off to just be prepared because it could happen. Even if we think it might not happen, it could happen. So being prepared if that is a main channel for, for any of you in the audience, but it's good for you to understand what might happen and be prepared. So, um, but, but let's move into, uh, into more amicable news. Uh, so Google integrated social media posts into your, uh, your uh, GBP, your Google business profile. And I think this is a great, this is a great piece of news for uh, local businesses um, that rely highly on their Google business profile uh, because now they can tie their Facebook, uh, TikTok, um, Twitter, um, et cetera, their social accounts to their Google business profiles and provide more information and more visibility and more awareness uh, for your for their audience or their prospective clients. So I think it's really simple. You can just link your profile to your GBP and it will start showing in your profile. So um, I think it will be will be interesting to see what impact this has on on local businesses to generate more more traffic, more leads. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, local businesses that are, are well ahead in their social game. They're they're being um, creating content consistently uh, because they will automatically um, will be able to have more visibility. I don't know, do you have any thoughts on this, Rick? I think it's it's a really interesting move. Um, I, I need to see how they're laying it out, but but now being able to get real time information that would otherwise only be shared with your social media uh, audience is now out there at the top of of Google search for anyone doing a local search where your business would show up. What a great way to be able to communicate in real time. Well, not in real time, but you know, really up to date information. If you're having a, a sale or an event, rather than having to go and update your 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 uh, GB, I always want to call it Google My Business, but I know it's GBP now. Um, <laughs> but rather than having to go and update that, a simple social media post could still get that information out there. That's that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, I think this is great news. It's not yet available in all geos. So uh, I assume like everything Google, they'll roll it out slowly, uh, test it out and uh, work out the kinks and then roll it out to more geos. So, but I'm really excited um, to see how that turns out. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, the probably the topic that has been the most talked about over the last few weeks. And that is <laughs> Google's March core update in the spam manual actions. We talked about it last week. Um, and yeah, we cannot not talk about it because it's what uh, every marketer or content marketer and every SEO is talking about. So uh, I don't know, Rick, so you were uh, looking at some some content that came out. Um, one of the top publications, I think, was either Search Engine Journal or Search Engine Land. And yeah, you have some 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 pointers, some insights, uh, some findings. Yeah, some data. Uh, Search Engine Journal pu uh, published an article um, citing some data uh, from a study by Eric Newtall. Not tall. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, <laughs> And and it's interesting stuff. So I thought we'd share it with the audience today. So everybody is By talking way, about this. Ian score. Ian Newtall. Ian, what did I say? Eric. Did I say Ian? I said Eric. Sorry, Ian. No. <laughs> if you're, if you're yeah, listening, sorry. I probably got both names wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, the March update is it, it aims to prioritize high quality human written content uh, and combat AI generated spam content. Um, and I, I don't know where this number came from, so take it with a grain of salt, but I hear the goal is to reduce that type of result in search by 40%. Um, so there, there is actually targeting two things here, Carlos. One is spam, mm -hmm. uh, and they're doing that through basically targeting link building farms. So they're going after... Uh, Sites that were purchased, uh, like expired domain abuse. Yeah. Um, these are websites that get bought up and then used for low quality posting, either either backlink posting or for the actual uh, AI generated spam. Um, they're going after scaled content abuse. That's the the you know the AI heist or the SEO heist type of sites 
that just spring up and suddenly in the first month they've got 1500 articles published uh, and on and on and, and all of it just aimed at grabbing, you know, SEO traffic um, and reputation ab abuse, which is uh, third party pages being published. So this is your site publishing third party uh, content without a whole lot of oversight. Again, going after the guest posting, um, backlink building, Thing. But the other part of it is the AI content, um, which is just low quality mass produced AI. And I'll get into the difference between that and non spammy AI content in just a minute. But let's get into the data. So, yeah, Ian, before, before, uh, before that, Rick, it's very important to, to um, clarify one thing that the core algorithm update and the manual action are two separate things that are happening kind of together. So there's a big update in the algorithm that is, again, um, incorporating a lot of the helpful content update um, signals and markers uh, into the algorithm. Um, and at the same time, they're doing, they're taking manual action against the three things that you mentioned, which are authority abuse, um, aspired domain abuse, and also a scale abuse. So this, I think for the audience, it's very important to know that these are two separate things. Of course, they're somehow intertwined, but um, you can get caught by one or the other, or worst case, both. So it so, sounds but, like you know a little yeah. more about this. So the DN indexing, is that through the algorithm and the manual actions, or is that all That's manual, manual action? The indexing is all manual, manual action. So, okay. it, so you won't know if you get hit by a, an algorithm update until you see it, you, you will know indirectly by seeing your traffic decrease and your position um, decrease. The de-indexing, you actually get an, an alert or a notification in your Google search console. So um, two separate things. Manual action will de-index de -index your site or your, or your page or your pages. And the algorithm, just will, you'll see a, a decrease or an increase in traffic, to be fair, right? Because these... Uh, there's always winners and losers in this um, during during algorithm updates, but you had some some data and some insights from from what's happening. Yeah, so this guy Ian is tracking the status of uh, nearly fifty thousand websites, um, and practically <clears throat> overnight after this update, uh, nearly two percent of them, I think it was eight hundred thirty-seven sites, disappeared. Those 800 sites were getting over 20 million views a month, generating almost half a million uh, in monthly ad revenue, gone. Um, now, I don't want our audience to misunderstand that, well, it was just 800 sites. He's only tracking 50,000. For context, there are approximately 200 million active websites out there right now. They're not all indexed by Google, but a good amount of them are. Um, and <laughs> most of those websites are either B2B, B2C. Um, so scale up his findings. I think 50,000 websites that he's tracking is probably enough to be representative um, of, of, of the indexed internet as a whole. But, but that's 2% is a big number. It is a big number. Um, I, I follow um, lots of SEO thought leaders or content marketing thought leaders or marketing thought leaders. And yeah, there is a lot of chatter around this. You get here more and more. Now, some sites, a few, very few that have been the index, I'm starting to see recovery or being re-indexed again. However, I think um, you need to take action to make sure that you can get re-indexed. So you need to can submit um, a case to Google and say, hey, these are the actions that I'm taking to correct the problem to get re-indexed. And I think you have to demonstrate that you're doing something. Just saying, hey, can you please re-index my site is not gonna cut it. So um, again, I think we are still going through it. Um, what Google have said is that uh, the algorithm or the core update is gonna, is gonna take over the whole month of March to roll out. So it's very early to make conclusions. Um, mm -hmm. that's on the algorithm update side, but if you have been hit by manual action, you need to take action right away. You, you don't need to wait until, 
until the end of the month because that's that it's not related to the algorithm um, update. So, and if you haven't again, been hit and you're in a panic, you probably well, if you're listening to us, you probably shouldn't panic. Um, <laughs> you know, because you're probably doing things the right way. Um, but if you are creating content at scale through simple prompt, you know, one prompt, boom, there's a whole article or a couple prompts and boom, there's a whole article with no real human oversight, uh, no real human editing, um, you should worry. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that AI is, is no longer welcome on Google. Like Carlos, we have several clients um, who we work with in various ways. Uh, we have one client who has us do exhaustive data research. And we compile all of this data so that we can isolate it with AI to create content that we know is factually accurate. And then we review it with human editors. Um, we have another client who provide us, provides us with detailed information, transcripts, interviews, uh, and then has a writer use AI to bring all of that together and help create his content. And we have a third who actually creates the AI content himself. And he goes through it and marks it up with his insights, his thoughts, you know, this isn't quite right. And then we get the marked up copy and we have a human editor go through and, and polish it up based on his comments. All of those methods will work and none of those clients need to worry, you know, because that's doing it the right way. It's using AI as a tool to assist in making better content. And if that's what you're doing, you shouldn't worry. Yeah, that's a great point, Rick. And I think if you've been doing the right things, um, and maybe you've been dabbling with AI, um, but putting out some of your own spin, your own insights, um, it should be fine. As long as you're not abusing any of these things, like you know, um, the, these link farms or just buying shady links or buying shady sites just to get links back to your site. Like you know, Like, you know if you're doing things right or not. And if you're not sure, well, you should check with your team and get an audit. So... My advice for anybody that is worried about this is do an audit on your site. Do an audit to see how uh, how helpful the content is. Sure. Um, also, maybe run some of the content and check for uh, for AI generation. Uh, and I would again, I would caveat this because we don't fully trust the AI checkers, but I would use them kind of to to give you a flag, right? And flag some content and, and do a manual audit with somebody that is really is really familiar with content. Uh, actually, our friends are over at originality.ai, who uh, they own one of the most popular checkers. They also did a study of these sites that were the index. And what they found is that 100% of the sites that were the index had some component of AI content. And 50% of those that were the index had 90 to 100% AI content. So there is a big correlation. But again, this also is related to abusing, uh, like a scale abuse. So if you're going to publish 1,000 thousand blocks, all AI generated overnight, huge red flag. And look, this is not, this is not how the internet works anymore, right? It's, you, know, you cannot brute force your way into rankings. It might work. It might work for a while, um, but it's not sustainable. And now Google's getting very serious about it. So anyway, if you need help. We're happy to um, short-term games. Yeah, but uh, we can help you with a, with a, with a content audit. Uh, we can help you up, up, upgrade or refresh your content if you are worried about this. We can happy to to take a look at your content and give you some recommendations. But anyway, uh, let's move into our next topic, which is content ROI. So <clears throat> this is one of the <laughs> biggest headaches for some marketers because um, you know measuring ROI in marketing is is, is hard sometimes. Uh, measuring attribution, measuring channels, measuring um, ROI is, is one of the hardest things, but it's very important to measure your marketing ROI and your content ROI if you wanted to continue to invest on it. So um, we we just published an article about content ROI where you can understand the difference between what is how do you measure ROI and what is the, the role of KPIs. KPIs and ROI are not the same. KPIs are things that are going to help you measure some of your success or some of your success in certain aspects. But um, the ROI is just a pretty hard call measure of is your content being profitable, right? We internally in in, in crowd content, we just we just did this math very recently, and we we're spending anywhere between ten and twenty grand in content um, a month, and that's on the low end. 
So means on a, on a yearly basis, we're spending over six figures, but it, it, for us, it just takes a couple of good deals to recover our money, right? So we can say that um, for or ROI um, is, is anywhere between <clears throat> five to 10 times, depending on the year, um, depending also on in, 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 in the kind of deals that we land, but we know that is going to be positive and we have been able to prove this over time. So it's very important for people to understand how to measure the, the ROI. It's fairly simple. How much does it cost you to produce your content? But it's not only the cost of paying the writer or paying the, your agency or paying your, your provider. It's also your, your internal time, uh, your overhead, uh, publishing time, hosting time, hosting, hosting costs, all those things. Put all that in the cost bucket and track the revenue that you're generating. Uh, I know sometimes content is not just necessarily to generate revenue, but at the end of the day, if it is part of marketing, it has to generate revenue somehow, right? Sometimes it's thought leadership, brand, brand awareness, but you're doing all of those things to, at the end of the day, generate more business. So you need to measure how much business are you, are you generating and what is your cost? Fairly straightforward, fairly simple. I know really the nuances is in how to measure uh, the attribution, how to measure whether the, the revenue came from your efforts or not. But um, but I think uh, it's important to, to dig into this. Um, read the article, There's, there are more, of course, more details and more tips on how to measure content marketing ROI. Um, but, but Rick, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, Jed, yeah, just one tip, and it's for all of those who are thinking, you know, it is next to impossible to, to determine ROI on content marketing. Um, rather than get into the granular page by page problem, one good method is any conversion, if they touched another page, and, and this is something you can track, if they landed on any other page, whether it was your blog post or a service page, um, before they got to the page they converted on or became a lead, then count that. And the revenue that they generated counts for a content marketing conversion. Um, you can get really, really granular and start measuring the impact because, you know, tofu content isn't really meant to convert, right? But it's part of the equation. So trying to measure ROI on, on top or even some mid funnel content is really, really hard to do. So look at the thing more holistically, you know, and segment off the, uh, all of your funnel content and just say any, any journey that started somewhere in here, they land on one of these pages before they converted, then that's a conversion for content marketing. Yeah. Any, 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 I think any conversion that comes through your website or that comes through a web form, it should be easier to measure. Right? It's harder when um, most of your leads come through sales, sales people or, you know, referrals. That's a little bit harder, but, um, but yeah, you need to start somewhere. So it's very important that you measure the ROI of your content so you can get more budget and can continue to invest on it. And the good thing about especially SEO and organic content or organic traffic is sometimes the ROI can be infinite. And where am I going with that is that we have a piece of content we created many, many years ago that is still generate traffic for us and drive conversions. So the beauty about SEO is that it is very sustainable in the long term. So there are dollars that you might be investing today that might continue to give you returns for even a decade. So I think part of your case is, is also that you don't need to measure the ROI just today. Like, okay, how many, um, how much revenue was generated this year, but also, okay, <clears throat> the content that you're producing today might generate revenue in the future. So, um, uh, you might want to, um, compare, um, compare periods depending on, on when the content was created and when are they, if you can get to that granularity, like when was this blog post created or this piece of content created and when was the revenue generated? Um, cause then that cost is, is, is far in the past and you're pretty much generating, um, infinite ROI anyway. So, um, take a, take a look at the article and, and make sure that you're measuring your ROI so you can continue to get budget for it. Uh, okay. So, um, Rick CMI or friends over at content marketing Institute, uh, they, they released great content of course, and they, um, they did a study on, and they, they do studies all, all throughout the year around, um, content marketing for enterprise. 
and they just released one recently. Um, so yeah, why don't you share with us some findings in that study? Sure. So uh, this study, which is um, enterprise content marketing enterprise 2024, um, was part of a lar larger data gathering effort they did um, late last year, I think. But they've extracted 333 participants um, in the study uh, deemed enterprise, uh, mostly B2B and mostly in North America, and then put this report together on their uh, on their findings. So it's a big report, like most of the state of this or that type of uh reports that come out every year. So I just wanted to focus on one section of it that I found interesting, uh, had some statistics, basically asked uh, the participants to rate their the success they had in their content marketing efforts, um, found that 29% of the group rated their efforts as extremely or very successful. Uh, 56 reported moderate success and just 15% rated minimal or no success at all. Um, so that kind of lays the foundation for what I want to talk about here. Uh, so uh, 85, is, what, I'm, what I'm taking is 86% of respondents are finding content marketing successful. So that's a great stat to share uh, to share with your bosses or your, your C-suite uh, there in your company if you're struggling yeah. to, get, uh, to get budget for content marketing. Yeah, nearly a full third is extremely or very successful. That's that's significant. Um, there were some common traits uh, given between uh, those companies who rated themselves very successful uh, when asked about their content marketing um, strategy. Uh, so have you read this already, Carlos? I was going to quiz you to see if you could guess what, what some of these traits were. <clears throat> I, I skimmed through it. You skimmed through it? All right. Knowing your audience, 76% uh, felt very confident that they knew their audience. And when we say no, that you know your audience in content marketing, it's more than being able to say who they are. Right, Carlos? It's, it's, it's what, what pains do they feel? Like, what do they need? What kind of questions are they asking? You know, within our industry, within our niche, you know, what are they experiencing? You know, and how can we help them? What What do they need from us? That's knowing your audience. Um, setting goals that align with business objectives. This is an exercise we just went through in preparing for our Q2 content was, you know, what do we really want to accomplish? And then how do we create content that aligns with those goals? 73% um, of those top performers set goals for content marketing that align with their business objectives. Um, collaboration with other teams, 62%. You know, content is not made in a silo. Uh, our, you see it, Carlos, our internal content call, uh, our weekly call, pretty much covers the, the entire scope of our company. We got people on there from all over the place. Um, what else we got here? Ability to measure or show content performance. Well, we just talked about that. Uh, you, you've got to have the data to be able to adjust and make decisions. Um, the documented strategy, 57%, and producing thought leadership was 51%. So I'm sure a lot of you are doing some of these. Uh, maybe you're doing most. Uh, but this is where you really need to focus. You should be doing all of these things and to, to mimic what they're doing. If you're doing all these things, you stand a higher chance of being successful. Uh, but there are some other interesting stats and I'll try to get through this quick. I know uh, we're, we're running a little long, uh, but high performers, 90% of them said that they are backed by leaders who understand content marketing. They understand the work they do as compared to 77% of all respondents. Now I kind of wish that CMI had gone a different route to illustrate this because they're showing 90% of the top performers versus 77% of all, but that all includes the top performers, which is nearly a third of the group. So to really illustrate that, I wish they had done the math and shown us, you know, 90% of top performers have leadership that understands content marketing versus a, what would ultimately be a much lower percentage of those who only experienced moderate success or no or very little success. 
Um, so understand that with these stats, the all respondents does include the top performers. But let's go through these real quick. And I won't pretend. I am reading them for you. Uh, more likely to have a strategy integrated into their overall marketing uh, strategy, 79% versus 60%. Faced fewer layoffs in the last year, 11 versus 23%. Are more likely to invest in additional content management technologies in 2024, 53% versus 43%. Often agree that their organization measures content performance effectively, 78% versus 39%. There's that measuring again. Hard to make informed decisions if you don't know how your content is performing. Um, they're also more likely to increase their paid advertising spend, 57 versus 43. There's some more, but I, I think you get the gist of it here. Um, did you see anything in there, Carlos, that you found interesting or really stood out? Oh, there is one other thing before you do that. There was no disparity, no difference in AI usage um, or acceptance or adoption between the top performers uh, and the lower ranks. Yeah, yeah. No, this is all. So really, my takeaway is if you have good alignment of goals, teams and leadership and you have a cohesive strategy that you measure, you should be successful or at least you're on your path to success. So very, very clear. And loud. this is I why you're the boss, man. You just <laughs> you just said what I could what, what took me. A thousand words to, to ramble out. You, you you wrapped it up in about twenty. <laughs> well, that's very that's very kind of you. Uh, but um, the, the the thing I found interesting is that only I think fifty eight percent of respondents were using AI daily. And one of the th things that they that they mentioned as an obstacle is that some of their companies are not allowing them to um, to to use AI. They're pretty much banning the use of AI or restricting it. And two, there's people, there's a lot of fear about um, uh, fake information or wrong information. So <clears throat> I think as the, big, the, the the bigger the company gets, the harder it is to do um, use innovative tools because um, there's more fear. There is more at stake as well. It's, the, it's different if, let's say, a big bank, uh, Bank of America comes out with a piece of content that is full AI with a riddle with mistakes than if, you know, um, or little plumbing shop down the street, right? So different, different stakes. So yeah, something to take, to, to take into consideration, but yeah, but probably there's not, uh, that I found in, insightful that there's no difference in performance, uh, for people that are using AI or not. I think really the difference would be on cost maybe, or ability to scale rather than really, um, ability to perform. But anyway, really good finance. We'll link, um, the study into the newsletter for you to uh, read in your leisure time. Okay, and let's close this episode talking about what are the advantages of using video when you're using SMEs um, in your pre-production, in your content pre-production. This sounds fancy, but it's just a very, very fancy way to say, uh, you use video to record your SME insights. Is, is that where we're going, Rick? That's kind of where we're going. Um... But I'm going to get into a little bit more detail because I always do, right? So I want to show you a way to enhance your content authenticity and depth to balance SEO uh, outlines with insight rich outlines to boost reader engagement and, and to end up with some really rich source material for repurposing content for social media when all is said and done. Um, it's nothing new getting, you know, we, we've talked about this before, getting your SMEs involved in pre-production, uh, getting them involved in brief creation. Uh, but what I've noticed, um, because I, I do it myself, right? When our team creates content briefs, we have a point of view component uh, in there and they'll shoot a message to me and, hey, can you get your thoughts in here for the writer? I'm like, sure, absolutely. And I'm a writer. And I stare at it and I'm like, I don't know what I want to write. There's so much lost because, you know, brevity comes into play, which I struggle with. But still, um, there, there's a lot lost in just trying to get a few sentences of insights or here's our stance on this or our opinion. Um, and and it, it ends up not giving the writer as much to work with as you really could. So what I'm recommending 
is that you create your outlines for your content in the brief creation space as you normally would, accounting for thorough coverage of the subject matter. Um, you do have to compete with your, your SERP competitors. So, so set up an outline that covers the subject thoroughly uh, and integrates whatever SEO you need integrated. Then it goes over to your SME who rather than putting comments on the brief or adding to the outline or, or, or typing something up in that point of view component, they're now recording a video with a certain, you know, a set of instructions that goes over uh, back to your team, your brief creation team, uh, when it's finished. What this does, and here's another use case for AI, you get that transcript. Whatever you're using to record the video, make sure you can produce a transcript of the video. You then plug that transcript and the um, original outline into AI, and you have it sort through what's being said, find logical places to put this in the outline, take the segments of the transcript, add them as comments to the brief so you don't end up with this massive thing. The writer can see the, the, the relevant part that they need at each part as they're going through the outline and creating it. Boom, there's a comment with what the SME said about this, this subject matter. They don't have to go through the huge transcript to do it. Um, and it helps you get all that experience, all of the anecdotes. People Look at me. I, I can't shut my mouth, right? Talking about this stuff. So when it comes to really having thoughts and insights and stories and anecdotes, getting someone to talk is much more valuable than asking them to write a few quick sentences that, that give their stance. Now you have all of this available for the writer. It shows up in the content. That's your information gain. That's your differentiation. That's getting helpful content that shows experience and expertise. That's, you know, the ability to do storytelling, which which is extremely effective in, in content. Uh, it's all there. And all you need to do is get your SME. And I use the term SME. It's really your person of focus for whatever the article is, right? Sometimes it's me internally. Sometimes it's Carlos. Sometimes it's our SEO people. It's whoever really has the most to say about whatever subject you're writing about for, for this article. They're the ones who should sit down, encourage them to do 15 minutes of talking, equip them with the outline, have them go through it, give them this set of instructions, review the provided outline to understand the content structure and the main points. Think about personal experiences or anecdotes related to those topics. Be ready to discuss your professional insights, emphasizing any unique perspectives, share any challenges or successes you've encountered in relation to those topics, uh, mention any relevant trends or future predictions you see, and talk about anything you feel is maybe missing from the outline. And then take that transcript, AI, weave the outline and, and all of those anecdotes and thoughts and insights together, and you have a very, very powerful resource for your writers. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm a great tip. This, Carlos. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, no, I'm excited too. I think um, I think AI uh, transcription, video transcription has been a game changer, especially for this, right? Capturing um, subject matter experts' opinions. So you can uh, just, of, of course, the quality of their of their answers are also going to be dependent on the quality of your questions. So you need to prepare your SME interview or your SME um information capture template i think rick this is a, an idea here just um that we should maybe prepare a, a guide or a template for people to interview smes and capture their 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 insights because i think our audience would find it very um, useful to have that so oh, they can forgot. send their sme yeah i forgot the, the best part of this well not the best part but you're left over with this valuable resource that can be repurposed into other content quotes for for future content you know start you can again use ai to find find me the impactful quotes from this transcript put them all in a sheet start saving them over time you've got this wealth of unique valuable quotes that aren't anywhere else on the internet um it, it's really the way to go stop having your smes right on your briefs Oh no! Don't don't make your SMEs right, please. Don't. <laughs> Most of them are not really good writers, and they're not gonna really appreciate it because their job is to be SMEs in in their particular uh, topic, not to be writers. So, um, yeah, if you can get them to 
record themselves or you can you know just have a zoom call or a, a, any platform of your preference to record the the record the interview plug in uh fireflies ai or or uh, fathom or any of these tools and you have a lot of material there to use your in your content anyway great tips rick thank you as always for uh, those valuable insights. And that's it for today. Uh, I'm sorry we went longer than our, our last two or three episodes. Back <laughs> to it. But there's so much to talk about. So um, I hope some of you find it helpful and insightful. And good luck there with um, navigating the <laughs> the Google Core update and the manual action. And do call us if you need help with anything on that regard. And yeah, again, share, subscribe, please. Um, share this information with um, somebody else that you think if they're going to find it helpful, go give us a like on, on, our, on our YouTube channel, make comments, give us feedback, etc. Thank you, everybody, and uh, until the next one. See you next week. <laughs>